Next is Jerry Roberts, and Jerry, I think you're going to tackle some of the structural issues that we've faced and have been and are, and that Lou alluded to. Thank you, uh, <coughs> Susan. Thank you all for coming, and I also want to second Lou's motion and say what an honor it is to be uh, a member of this extraordinary uh, board of trustees at, at Antioch uh, University. Um, I also want to say that I'm really glad that this isn't about doom and gloom after listening to uh, <laughs> Susan and Lou, uh, that things are, things are working out. Um, I think what's happening, in, uh, what's happening in Sacramento today is kind of a perfect storm of uh, political and economic and, and social issues which have really uh, come together to create, uh, really there's no other word for it, but uh, dysfunction. Uh, and I want to talk a about the uh, mostly the political aspects of that. And since we are in a academic setting, I think it's appropriate to to define our terms to begin. And uh, the classic uh, definition of politics, of course, has has two roots: poly, from the Greek word meaning the many, and and tics, meaning blood sucking vermin. <laughs> And Mayor and Congresswoman, I want you to know that I mean that in the nicest possible way. <laughs> sure you do. Actually, that, that definition is not all that far off from how people view uh, our politicians these days. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, it's true. Uh, among voters who overwhelmingly put Arnold Schwarzenegger into office uh, just eight years ago, uh, less than one-third now view him favorably, according to the Public Policy Institute of California's most recent poll. And that sorry figure is a veritable celebration of the man uh, compared to public opinion about the legislature, which now has an 11 percent approval rating uh, right down there with uh, uh, lawyers and uh, uh, hedge fund salesmen and journalists. Um, <laughs> Uh, the Economist magazine not long ago ran a lengthy piece on the state's problems, which was tellingly titled The Ungovernable State. It said, a good outcome is no longer possible, the Economist ominously said of our current budget woes. One way or the other, Californians will have to begin discussing how to fix their broken state. Our problem begins, obviously, with the state budget, and the budget really uh, matters because it funds a, not only a physical infrastructure, but also a social infrastructure that allows us to develop our, our private economy. And we have huge funds to, uh, problems today with our highways and our water services, uh, not to mention our schools, our higher ed, and so on and so forth. Uh, Susan talked about the magnitude of the budget deficit. It was about $20 billion this year, but there are deficits projected for the next four or five of the out years, which run into the hundreds of millions of dollars. And the impacts of these are, are very easy to see. Smaller or larger class sizes an end to the smaller class size program in many schools. Uh, shorter school years, many thousands of students denied access to the University of California to CSUs. Um, I think our most vulnerable citizens, the aged, blind, disabled, young people, having services cut uh, con uh, consistently. Uh, parks, prisons, every uh, line item that you go through in the budget is being reduced. As a practical matter, the state uh, this year is spending about $86 billion in its general fund budget, which sounds like a lot of money. But if you go back a decade to 1999-2000, we were spending $66.5 billion and adjusted for inflation, that is a real decrease of 11%. So with an increase of several million people, we are now spending 11% less than we were then. But there are real structural problems in the state government that are bringing this about and that explain why we have these out-year deficits. I want to talk about six of them just really, really briefly uh, that form this kind of perfect storm. Lou talked about Proposition 13, and, and I'm also not one who, who likes to harp on Proposition 13, but it is a fact that since its passage in 1978, it has completely realigned, in fact, some would say tangled, the systems of government, local and state government, in the state of, of California. The fact of the matter is that state government's response to Proposition 13 was to take on many of the services that local government used to pay for, specifically schools, social welfare programs, and so on and so forth. The other piece of it was to take what was then a $5 billion surplus and to give it as a bailout 
to the local uh, governments. And we are living today with the fallout from those decisions that were made immediately after the, pro the passage of Proposition 13. And as a result, all of the political power over much of local government now resides in Sacramento. And it is that tangle which I think begins to explain some of our budget issues. Uh, another big factor has been the large number of initiatives that have passed that specifically address the budget. And again, this has taken power away from our elected officials, which some people might think is a good thing, but in a system of representative democracy, in fact, I would argue uh, that it has had the opposite effect. From Proposition 98, to the lottery, to any number of other uh, ballot box budgeting things, more and more of the budget has been taken out of the purview of elected officials and put on automatic pilot so that the amount of the budget that can actually uh, be dealt with from year to year is quite small. A third important factor has been the gerrymandering uh, of our political districts. And since uh, 1980, at least, to a certain extent, it has always been thus. But because of technology and because of the ability to micro-target uh, interest groups, our political districts, in terms of the legislature today, uh, are generally safe Democratic seats or safe Republican seats. And as a practical matter, what this means is that the most liberal Democrats tend to vote in primaries, the most conservative uh, Republicans. And so the general election very often becomes uh, uh, more or less unimportant. Whoever wins the primary uh, is the person who's going to win that seat. And so what you have in Sacramento is very liberal Democrats and very conservative Republicans. And the notion of a political middle or, or moderates has really gone away. And that's why we see this polarization in almost every single issue. Term limits has had a, a huge effect. Uh, as you all know, term limits was approved in 1990 by the voters. Again, seemed like a good idea at the time. Uh, but its primary proponent then, Pete Wilson, former Governor Pete Wilson, former Senator as well, uh, now uh, disavows it and says he thinks it was a mistake because of the unintended consequences. And the unintended consequences are that because our lawmakers are limited to six years or eight years, depending what house, as soon as they get to Sacramento, they tend to be looking around for where's the next step that I go to. And as a practical matter, the effect of this is they don't really want to or care to live with the long-term impacts of the decisions that are being made. The other thing is that the institutional memory of Sacramento now resides with the lobbyists so that the expertise on particular issues, and indeed much of the legislation itself, is generated by lobbyists. Our tax system is a boomer bust, is set up for boomer bust, very reliant on the personal income tax, so that in good times we have a surplus of revenue, in bad times we have a dearth. And politicians being politicians, and I accept the present company, of course, it's kind of like dogs that chase cars, you know? Say, Don't ever do that again. Okay, I won't, you know, and the dog will be there until the next car comes along. So as Lou pointed out, when the, when the state was fat with revenue uh, during the Davis era, it was all spent and then committed. So this boom and bust uh, structure of our tax system is a problem and one of the issues that uh, the governor, in, uh, in a very flawed way, attempted to deal with, with uh, with a special commission. Uh, the two-thirds vote Lou mentioned, the two-thirds vote really works two, two ways. One, it's necessary to pass a budget, but more importantly, it's necessary to pass almost any tax increase. Now, the two-thirds budget vote has been in the Constitution since before the, uh, the Great Depression. It was in there uh, as a way of guarding against uh, FDR liberals in the legislature. But the two-thirds vote for a tax increase has come with Proposition 13. California is one of 16 states that has a two-thirds vote for tax increases, but one of only three uh, that has it for the budget. It's the only state that has it for, for both. Today, there is not a single television news station in California that has a, that has a correspondent based in Sacramento. Uh, back when I was uh, covering the legislature, there was a governor called Jerry Brown, um, who may be around sooner rather than later, but uh, every TV station in LA, every TV station in, in San Francisco had a correspondent there, and these issues were covered. Uh, today, if it's not in TV, people don't really get that information, and, and even the newspapers that are covering them are really cutting their, their bureaus. And then, of course, we have a governor's race this year. I'll be glad to talk about that if you, if you want to, um, but uh, I don't hear anybody talking about major reforms in that group. So thank you very much.
And Mayor and Congresswoman, I want you to know that I mean that in the nicest possible way. <laughs> <laughs>